Microfinance Ireland, etc. Um, my corporate finance partner, Michael Neary, will be leading this part of the webinar, and he's been joined by Nick Ashmore, who is the CEO of SBCI. So we're very grateful for, to Nick for joining us. Uh, the second uh, area we're going to cover is effective cash flow forecasting. And my partner, Dara Kelly, will be covering this. And again, I think this will be very useful to, to people on the, on the webinar. Um, maybe before we get stuck into the contents, just wanted to share a couple of observations um, that we'd like to make. I suppose we spent the last few weeks doing quite a lot of talking to, to our clients, to the banks, to you know, intermediary contacts that we have. And maybe a couple of points we'd like to raise. Um, there's no doubt that the current measures that have been put in place are, are helping businesses. So things like, you know, the, uh, the COVID subsidy payments, the PAYE VAT deferrals, and also bank support in terms of um, amortization and interest holidays are having, you know, are having the desired effect in terms of helping people during the, the shutdown period. However, as we all know, the focus will soon and has to shift to the reboot phase, which hopefully is coming soon. Um, and I think, you know, to me, the reboot is probably the, the, the more difficult part for companies. Um, I think, you know, in, in terms of reboot and talking about stuff like funding of working capital, there will be set up costs to get them back up and running. And naturally enough, there will be a period where businesses will operate at a loss when they, when they start up again. Um, so we think it's, it's really, really important to plan and understand what your requirements are going to be during that reboot period. And I know Michael is going to talk about the Enterprise Ireland support around business plans. And we're encouraging all of our clients that are uh, eligible for this to avail of it because it really is going to be important. Um, it's obviously very difficult to call what business will look like and the timing of reopens. Um, and Dara is going to cover, you know, I think you, you got you to work on a base case and then sensitize uh, accordingly. I think sensitivities are really important because, frankly, there is still a lot of uncertainty. Um, we also think it's really important that you engage with your stakeholders early, including your banks, and get on the front foot. We think, you know, absolute first up early riser advantage is going to be key here. Um, we expect that a lot of businesses will have an ask. So over and above, say, uh, capital and interest um, holidays, there will be an ask for additional funding or working capital. And as Michael will discuss, there are some good government supports available. So again, we just think it's really important to get out early on these um, however, we do think, I suppose, that there will be more needed. There are specific uh, market sectors that are really badly affected, say, like hospitality and retail, where I think, frankly, the, you know, there's going to have to be additional support. And um, the issues for these businesses are probably compounded by the fact that they operate in a negative working capital cycle. So the working capital requirement will be more than your typical business. Um, there's also that cohort of companies who don't sit in the SME bucket, but are in the kind of mid-capital space. And we know that the government are actively looking at uh, additional measures to help with these, uh, with these companies. And again, we just think it's really important. We also feel that it's really important that it's ready to go and that timing will be key in terms of rebooting the economy. Um, just in terms of hygiene for today, um, we're, we're hoping to keep it to an hour. Um, we will have Q&A, uh, so I will uh, manage the Q&A at the end of the webinar. So we'd encourage people to please ask questions and we'll do our best to answer them. And as I said, we will be passing around the video afterwards for those um, who haven't been able to, to join the webinar. So with that, I'll hand over to Michael, who's going to run through the, uh, the business supports that are available. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Paddy. And uh, just like to say good morning to everybody and hope uh, you all and your families are keeping well at this difficult time. Michael Neary is my name. I'm a corporate finance partner in the team in Grant Thornton. And uh, the objective of the next 10 minutes is I'm going to bring you through the um, announcement that Minister Humphreys made on the 8th of April and the support packages that um, are available through the SBCI, EI and the Microfinance Ireland. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Nick Ashmore, who, af who is the Chief Executive of the SBCI with us this morning. And after my presentation, um, we'll have a discussion with Nick and you can fill us in on some of the practicalities around the, um, the schemes that, that, that we're going to go through. So just moving along then, um, there are six areas uh, that were announced on the um, uh, on the 8th of April by the Minister for Business, Ms. Uh, Minister Humphreys. And um, these are what we understand to be the initial 
um, range of packages to help liquidity challenges of businesses uh, affected by COVID-19. So we're going, to, we're going to talk about the two Enterprise Ireland packages. Um, as everybody is, is aware, Enterprise Ireland is the state body, um, you know, uh, development agency uh, focusing on uh, delivering uh, export sales and helping the manufacturing and uh, internationally traded services sector. Um, so we have two things there. We've got the planning grant and the enterprise, a new enterprise um, sustaining a sustaining enterprise fund of 180 million. And the SBCI, which is the Strategic Bank Corporation of Ireland, um, set up in 2015 to offer uh, loans of attractive rates to SMEs and to give effective supports uh, to address failures in the um, Irish credit market um, and uh, with a mission to drive competition and innovation. I've got three um, packages. One, the COVID-19 working capital loan, of which there's 450 million available, and the extension of the future growth finance loan, a further 200 million on uh, what was a, a successful um, loan scheme that has been in action for, for a number of years. And finally, an extension to the credit guarantee scheme, which has also been in action for a number of years. And then finally, uh, to mention the Microfinance Ireland um, 20 million um, fund, Microfinance Ireland is a non-for-profit um, organization established under the Micro Enterprise Loan Act in 2012 and lends to businesses with um, less than 2 million a turnover uh, who cannot um, get funding from um, conventional sources. The EI um, Financial Planning Grant is in effect five grand of a grant um, to get an advisor to help you prepare a business plan and cash flows and to assess the impact of COVID-19 on your business. Um, this is a really attractive um, offer by Enterprise Ireland and it allows businesses to get advice um, at a critical stage. Um, the objective um, of the plan is to be able to go to your bank, to the SBCI or indeed to Enterprise Ireland and avail of some of the um, uh, supports that are, are available. Um, a couple of areas to note. Um, cash flow is a key part of this plan and assessing cash flow, but it is also a medium term view. So a three year business plan, three year uh, P&L balance sheet and cash flow, and also a 12 week uh, or a 12 week um, cash flow analysis as well, which is prepared. This grant is available to uh, all Enterprise Ireland IDA clients. It's also available to Uderos and to the clients and manufacturing and international businesses that employ, employ more than 10 um, full-time employees. A key, a key aspect as well is that uh, the business is materially impacted by COVID-19. Um, and we understand that to be um, having a 15% or greater impact on turnover of profit. A key aspect as well is that the business is viable. So mo moving along, some of the key things that we're seeing, um, we, have, uh, we have worked quite, uh, quite a lot with Enterprise Ireland and specifically over the course of the last two weeks to be, to, um, to be an active player in this market. We have uh, over 10 senior uh, people involved in supplying um, this business plan to um, SMEs up and down the length and breadth of the country. Um, some observations, uh, there is a specific out output report that is required and a financial data sheet, which is in effect a, um, a cash flow and a um, business plan tool that is required for the banks. Some other information that's required are three years out of the financial station uh, statements, uh, organizational chart, um, the, um, uh, the owners of the business, the sales pipeline, and we are advising clients to get this information together uh, and to get prepared to, um, you know, be, be, um, be, be ready to avail of the grant and to get basically stuck into preparing this information. 
um, because this really, this really is to move swiftly through the banking process and to getting the um, supports that are out there. So just, just moving along then um, onto the Enterprise Fund. Um, this is a, a fund that will be available up to 800,000 per business. Um, we know that uh, there'll be a 4% administration fee, um, but there will be a five-year repayment plan on this. And in, we understand that it will be repayment at the end of five years. The form and the structure of, the, um, of this is, is to be confirmed, um, but we, we understand that it will be a, available to micro SMEs and small mid-cap businesses that have been affected to the tune of 15% or more by COVID-19, have fewer than 500 employees, more than 10, and that operate in the manufacturing or internationally traded businesses. A key aspect is that businesses have attempted to get um, a, a funding from the banks, the, or the SBCI. Another key aspect is that, that the business can show um, that it is viable. So this is a really, they're, they're two really timely and um, uh, really good initiatives by Enterprise Ireland that are open to a wide range of businesses. And from Grant Thornton's perspective, we're, we're really supportive of the business planning tool. And uh, we're encouraging all our clients and indeed businesses around the country to avail of that. And we want to be seen as, as a firm that is, is, is part of the solution in, in delivering that for clients. So moving along then to the SBCI, and this 450 million package is the working capital loan package. Um, some features, uh, it's available to uh, between 25,000 and 1.5 million for working capital uh, and for a term of between one and three years. Unsecured loan amount up to 500,000 and the maximum interest rate is 4%. There are interest only um, options um, in the loan and the loan and term is dependent on the purpose. The, uh, the loan purpose needs to be for working capital and to fund a significant change impacted by COVID-19. Again, it is available to micro SMEs and mid, small mid-cap businesses with fewer than 500 employees and turnover less than 50 million. Um, they need to be independent or autom autonomous and less than 25% held by public um, bodies. Again, it is important that these businesses are viable business and just moving along on the slides, um, this is being managed, the, the, the working capital loan and indeed the future uh, growth loan is being managed through the banks and uh, with an eligibility um, requirement to be filled out on the SBCI website. Um, the, second, um, the second SBCI package is the future growth loan. Now, this loan was a very, has been a very successful loan for businesses that have sought investment, uh, longer term investment for the likes of in, um, investment in machinery, equipment, research and development. And it has, uh, this extension is very welcomed for businesses that are seeking uh, loans of between 100,000 to 3 million uh, over an eight to 10 year period. Again, these loans are unsecured up to 500,000 uh, with interest rates above 250, or four and a half and below um, sorry, at uh, below a four and a half and above 250 of three and a half. So attractive interest rates and there are optional loan, uh, only interest only repayment options as well. Um, a key factor on the, um, these are managed through the, um, the on lending banks. So AIB, Bank of Ireland and, and Ulster Bank. And um, again, these are available to uh, the micro uh, SME and small cap businesses that um, that I've mentioned previously. Um, so a really a really uh, supportive long term loan um, available to businesses. Mo moving along then to the credit guarantee scheme, um, this is where an eighty percent guarantee is um, provided to the, the participating banks, um, AIB, Bank of Ireland, and Ulster Bank, and. Uh, this, uh, this is a credit uh, guarantee scheme which has been available for, for a number of years, uh, but the COVID-19, uh, it's particularly um, relevant and has been extended, uh, which is very, um, uh, which is very a good scheme at this time 
uh, when people are taking working capital on COVID-19, um, availing of the, that working capital loan. Again, this guarantee is for 80%. Um, it's for a period of up to seven years. It's eligible against loans that are the working capital loan, uh, but term loans, demand loans, and there are interest only options as well. Um, the credit guarantee scheme can be used by businesses to obtain loans and uh, where they have uh, meet the following criteria. There's an aggregate uh, collateral, uh, it's a novel business market, um, or there is a need for refinancing by an exit um, from a lender and leaving the, the Irish market. Um, there are restrictions on what it is not, uh, was not available against, uh, and that includes um, uh, primary production of agriculture, uh, refinancing of existing debts, and property relating activities. So just moving along, some further details on the, um, on the credit scheme. Um, again, available through the banks. Um, there is, uh, businesses need to speak to the participating bank to cover this. And um, the, the, the uh, incumbent or the participating bank will make decisions um, on the lending and the credit criteria. So, um, again, this is a, a, a very um, good and supportive package that we can that we will we will chat with Nick now in a moment about. Um, moving then finally to the microfinance loan. Um, microfinance are available to businesses of turnover up to two million, or net assets of less than two million. Um, again, affected to the tune of fifteen percent on turnover of profit on by COVID nineteen. Um, and the loans are available from five thousand to, to five hundred thousand or to fifty thousand available for three years, no repayment in the first six months um, and the interest rate is uh, five point five or four point five uh, on applications via the local enterprise offices. Microfinance Ireland work very closely with the enterprise offices around the country, and uh, requirements will include uh, the business plan and uh, six month uh, um, bank statements and, and credit reports. And again, this is uh, an important uh, piece for smaller businesses. So I'm going to stop for a moment and I'm, I'm going to um, maybe ask Nick to give his observations on uh, the packages that are available and uh, maybe some, some insights on what's been happening uh, since the um, supports have been announced. Thank you, Michael, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, Michael, can you just confirm you can hear me okay? Yes, I can indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, thank you for that uh, a, a very excellent run through of the um, of the various various supports that are available. I think the first point to make is that um, we are still early in in, in what is a, a major and, and long term dislocation in the market. Um, so, what we have um, on offer at the moment really is as an initial package uh, put together repurposing and, and reusing existing schemes and existing supports but also uh, in the case of things like the enterprise support package from enterprise island bringing forward uh, brand new schemes and facilities very quickly as well um, and we'll continue to work with the department of business and other stakeholders department of finance department of agriculture to develop these schemes and also look at other options to to bring supports the sbci for those of you who you may not have come across as before is a, a wholesale credit operation um, with a promotional focus so we're there to to help provide subsidized credit in one form or another both through banks and through non-bank institutions uh, we work with four non-banks to provide support for asset-based financing like leasing higher purchase invoice discounting and so forth uh, and details of those those providers like fexco finance island bibi and uh, capital flow are, are available on our website uh, we also share risk with the banks through these schemes. So the, the COVID working capital scheme and the future credit loan scheme are good examples of where we do that. And we, by providing a, an 80% guarantee on the loans, we then can require the banks to offer those loans on more attractive terms um, with less stringent security requirements because we're taking away um, the need for security on a substantial proportion of those loans. So the, the primary effort right now for us is around the COVID-19 working capital scheme, uh, but also we have available in the market the credit guarantee scheme as well. 
the COVID working capital scheme uh, is a descendant of a, a, a previous scheme called the Brexit loan scheme. Uh, it, it supports, as Michael said, three-year loans. It's really designed for working capital provision in a crisis. Um, we just designed it originally for a different crisis, but we've been able to repurpose it for this situation. And we're seeing a strong demand from businesses for eligibility codes in order to then start applying to the banks. So we've issued over 1,100 eligibility codes in the last two, three weeks. Uh, and that's off application volume of over 1,600 at this, at this stage. So we're turning around applications for eligibility within 48 hours now. Uh, and we have a customer service helpline. Uh, details are available on, on, on that on our website at spci.gov.ie. And that scheme is really designed to help just inject cash for working capital purposes as quickly as we can. Um, the loans are for three years, but there is flexibility and, and certainly the, the availability of a payment holiday upfront so that there's obviously not an immediate impact on cash flow within the businesses that are available to those loans. We're also seeing those loans translate through into sanctioned lending at the bank level. Obviously not quite at that scale yet, but we're seeing the volume start to come through well. So the banks are actively lending um, through the scheme with, with the support of the scheme. Uh, we expect to see a lot more businesses avail of that over the next month or so. The scheme originally started out with 200 million of capacity and that's already been boosted by a further 50 million and we have another 200 million in the pipeline. So uh, we expect that to be on stream uh, in the next month and that will therefore hopefully be able to continue to meet demand for that scheme as it ramps up. Um, we are already availing of additional supports from the European Investment Fund that's been made available post the COVID crisis in, in extending that scheme. The Future Growth Loan Scheme, which is our longer term scheme, has been running since about June, July last year. Uh, it was very popular over the second half of last year, and we largely filled the initial 300 million capacity. There is still some capacity left, mainly through KBC. Um, and those loans are very effective for supporting that longer term finance and creating that breathing room of having a, a lower capital repayment over the early years of an investment. And in that case also supports a, a payment break and payment holiday. Uh, we are working on the expansion of that scheme and that will come on stream probably in a number of tranches over the next month or so. Um, but that I think also reflects the fact that we're not expecting to see a huge demand for very long-term financing right now because so many businesses are still trying to understand the situation. The situation is highly changeable and highly volatile. And also it's not clear what, what investments, what long-term investments people are gonna to need to put in place as yet. Um, as we, you know, as we start to kick off the, the recovery phase or the re-emergence phase. Working capital is really the, the, um, the critical piece right now. Uh, the first phase that we understand from talking to the banks that they saw was, was really applications for overdraft facilities and also forbearance on existing lending. And the, the banks have been granting that um, to a greater extent than, than one might imagine. The feedback we've had from certainly some initial surveys is that very few SMEs are having an issue when they do talk to their banks, they're having a, a good response, a positive response. Uh, and I think the banks fully understand the nature of the crisis that we're facing. So the other scheme that, that Michael mentioned is the credit guarantee scheme. Uh, it doesn't have quite such an extensive guarantee, so there's no discount on the lending price and there's a small premium to pay. It's an older scheme that we've had around for a while. It is effective though, if you need a longer term loan than three years, it can do loans up to seven years. Uh, and the banks are, are offering that loan, that scheme right now, but we're not seeing a, a significant take up of that option, obviously, because I think the COVID scheme is a more attractive scheme. Uh, I suppose just to finish off, Michael, we also see the, the crisis as emerging in a number of phases. So we're very much in the, in the sort of the uh, sort of latter part of the first phase of the shutdown and the, the hiatus. Uh, the next phase is clearly going to be a degree of opening up followed by, by greater opening up across the economy as we go. Each of those phases is gonna bring different challenges. And obviously as, as businesses that have shut down completely um, have that overhang of, of deferred payments, whether that's tax rates, rent, um, loan repayments and so on, that's all building up at the moment. And so there will be a need for finance um, and other measures to support the businesses as they face that kind of presumption of activity and Included in that will need to be the ability to turn that debt out over longer periods of time. So those are sort of the things that we're, we're thinking about and working on at the moment. 
um, and elements of being able to take what might be short-term debt ar arising through the crisis and then spread that over a longer term will be a critical part of that. Um, so that's just very a very quick overview. Um, there's further details, FAQs, application forms, all available on the SPCI website at spci.gov.au. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Nick. Um, we, we, we do, as I said, we do have a Q&A function, so we'll, we'll hold uh, on the questions until the end, Nick, and, and thanks very much for that. That, that was great. Um, Dara, um, I'll pass over to you um, to talk through uh, effective cash flow forecasting. Uh, thanks, Paddy. Uh, you can confirm you can hear me? Yep. Great. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Dara Kelly. I'm a partner in the corporate finance team, and I hope everyone's well today. I'm going to cover a piece on cash flow forecasting, um, which is really a critical component um, of a business plan um, and you know, would form part of the requirements to access all of the funding uh, various funding options that Michael Neary just outlined, laid out there at the start of the presentation. So I suppose as a starting point, we've built up this deck. Um, the first slide will show like the questions we need to ask ourselves as, a, as our starting point. And then we move into how do we access the answers and, and what kind of outputs we get. So the first, I think, kind of fundamental questions is, we will look at our own business, we need to be planning for various scenarios. We need to un, you know, think about the risks that face our businesses, write them down and make sure that we're, we're thinking about scenario planning around those. Um, we need to think about our own cash generation um, cycle in our business. Um, do we fully understand it and, um, and how do we stack up to our peers? That leads into then the working capital structure of the business, um, how that how that lays out, and what's the timing of that of those conversions, um, and then into the into getting into the detail of can we get the data um, that we need to form a good view on our working capital, and help us um, forecast forward, and then the key you know key drivers of cash flow slash working capital is essentially seven main key drivers, which would be revenue growth, uh, gross margin, SG&A or other overheads. Then we're into AR, uh, AP, stock, and finally, um, CapEx. So we need to form a view on those seven drivers in order for us to build our, our accurate cash flow forecasting. And I think a really important thing here, and it's something we see a lot is um, maybe a lack of communication across a business when they're when they're when they're um, carrying out this process. It isn't essentially just the you know the CFO or the controller to put together the numbers. It's critical to get input from sales teams, you know, warehouse management, operations, you know, AP, AR. We need the full I think a full input and feedback. And you'll see as we work through the slides, it's, it it really. Um, it's an evolution um, and we, the more feedback will give a more accurate model. So work, working to the right of the page. So how do we, how do we, how do we answer all those questions? Well, we need, to, we need to identify all the components of working capital and get into the detail on that. You know, mainly AR, AP and inventory or stock. Um, we need to look at opportunities where we can shorten the conversion the cash conversion cycle of turning stock into, into receivables and then into cash. And be mindful of that as we're, as we're going through the detail. And then any other options we have to improve our own liquidity. Um, but a, again, a fundamental understanding of your working capital cycle and your cash conversion gives a lot of the outputs that you need in order to move to the right of the page. And that's into our cash flow projections. We form a base case, um, but it's really important to build out various scenarios um, and sensitivities on the base case. Uh, it comes back to, do we plan for scenarios? Well, we need to, because it's never more so, um, uh, we're, we're looking at some serious uncertainty over the, over the short to medium term around timings and what risks um, businesses will face. So we need to have 
um, multiple scenarios built out where we can see how our business would react if certain more than likely negative um, impacts hit. So that will allow us look at assess our funding gaps and our working capital requirements. And again, then gives you the final package that you can look at your overall funding facilities um, and the relationship you have with your lenders and the facilities that are in place and assess it, are you sufficiently covered to deal with reasonable scenarios. So then moving to the next slide, this is just some, some practical, uh, one slide back please. Yeah, so just some very quick practical tips, okay? So um, I'll move through these quite quickly. So the first thing is, it's just the, the, the it's just the point to, to think profits doesn't always equal cash. And we just think about the timings on that. So we really need to understand our um, receipts and payment cycle, the ins and outs uh, on our, essentially on our, our, our bank account. And that really feeds into then the 13 week cash flow, which I have a, a slide on further out. So it's just understanding profits is one thing, but what, how, does the, how did they behave from a cash flow perspective? Critical. Um, your cash conversion cycle, that's again back to the tr seven drivers I spoke about. Um, so really understanding those and how quickly do we turn profits into net cash flows for the business. Again, back into the detail of understanding your working capital. So don't forget seasonality. Um, might sound very obvious, but um, this is where getting good data of past performance will, get, will allow you to really understand the seasonality of your business. And just little things like you might have excess cash at various points, but also high creditors. And something that you could look at there is early payment discounts, assuming that you have enough cash to bring it in through the next cycle. But just that's the having that level of understanding opens up those possibilities of taking advantage um, which will net out to a, a greater positive cash uh, number at the end of your 12 month um, period. Next point is to create multiple scenarios. Um, you know, again, we touched on it earlier, but it, it puts you, if you have this scenario analysis done, it, it, it means you can be a little bit more proactive than reactive because you understand how something will play out should it occur. So again, building up a, a strong base case with multiple scenarios or sensitivities is critical to, to good cash flow management. Then, you know, detail and build up. So we think now all businesses should be looking at building up a 13 week cash flow, and then you can build it up into monthly, quarterly, and into your annual picture. And the final point is review, adjust, repeat. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing evolution. Um, you'll get more accurate as you go out because you're, you'll get more tuned in on the different trends and fluctuations but again it's not something that we do and then that's it for the you know for the next 12 months it's something that it's a rolling uh, rolling live document so we just go quickly to the next slide i just thought that this is a very something we put the top, one on the top left a very um illustrative uh, show of, of, of a cash flow requirement for a, biz, a client that we did recently. And it's just simply, they are running a very tight stock. So they do a combination of just in time and consi consignment stock. So they order the stock when they get the, the order in from the customer. Now that, the credit period on that stock starts immediately, but it takes them 10, 10 days to fulfill the order so that they can then get their invoice out. And what that throws up is, is the fact that you have to, this business has to pay their supplier 10 days before they get the cash from their customer. Very simple, but it just illustrates. Now, there's, there's a couple of different ways to deal with that, um, but that's just that, that level of simple understanding is critical when you start building out your cash flows. The example on the right's a lot more uh, detailed and a lot longer cycle, and it was a manufacturing business. So again, just understanding from a customer order to a customer payment and the, um, the cash requirement in between is critical uh, to building up a, your own cash flows. So we go to the next slide. Now, there's a lot of detail on this and we are sharing the slides, but we just thought to put down a couple of, of, um, 
of options to look at to try and improve um, your, you know, and optimize your own cash flows. The first two debtors in stock are probably where the most gains can be had. Um, usually two large numbers on our, our, our on your balance sheet. And if you can get them down um, as, 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 as efficiently as you can, it'll turn to cash. So um, I won't go through each of them, but you know, very simple things like you could, you could look at your credit terms that you're offering your customers, see if they could be pulled in. Um, I think enforce late payment penalties, at least have that on account, like post the late payment, gives you options to deal with that individual, maybe you know, generate some goodwill by actually giving a, 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 a wave of the penalty, but do, if you're going to put them in your terms and conditions, do, do action them. And then I think now the increasing AR resourcing, very important, like um, especially now put, making sure that you're, get, you're chasing um, invoices due. I think it does justify additional resources right now to ensure that we're trying to chase down um, and manage that as much as possible. On the stock side, again, um, you know, no over ordering, obviously, but look at what stocks on on your premises. Is there a possibility for some discount sales if it's if it's if it's um, slow moving? Um, look, you know, make sure ordering forward is 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 efficient, and that you're communicating well with the sales team, so you understand what pro what level of stock you have, because obviously that stock in the business is generating a liability and it's tying up cash. On the creditor side, um, I think stop early payments unless you're getting a, a, a payment discount for it. Um, and I think on credit terms, and there's a, I have a point at the end on this, be proactive on managing your credit terms because you don't want to get any effect to your credit history. So if you're clearly planning on um, on pulling um and uh, you know looking for an extension on credit terms get front foot and communicate with it with the supplier and explain give a timeline around it you technically overrun uh, when you should have paid for, for the product or the services but it keeps it in control um so so i think communication is key other creditors well this is this is um i think just a full review of all standing orders the amount you know and understanding I think people sometimes set up standing orders and um, and it might lose control or tracking of them. Um, other options are is where you have the the option to pay something over say ten months of 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 equal payments when that only generates a small kind of charge as opposed to once off payments such as like uh, insurance or something like that. Look at payment options around smoothing out lumpy payments. Into then on the assets and facility side, we'll look assets, just look at anything that's non-core, uh, consider why is it being held, should it not be, be sold out, sale and lease back options, obviously on chunkier assets, and if you have unencumbered assets, um, they can come into play when you're, when, you're, when you're talking to your lenders around facilities. And I think Michael covered the facilities piece um, quite well, so just look at all the options that are there. Um, and especially now the, 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 the government supports. The next slide is just, um, just a, it's a snapshot of a 13 week cash flow. And I think this is the important things. This is not in stat, statutory uh, format. This is receipts and payments, ins and outs. And you really, when you're preparing one of these, you really get into the detail of the business and um, it really gives you really good control. Now you should, when you have this in place, you need to drop in the actuals as you go out through the 13 weeks so you can see is there slippage of payments, um, especially around the receipt side, to see how you then manage your, your payments out. But again, like it's a, it's very, it's a lot of detail, but, but, but very powerful um, to allow you to manage your cash. And then on the last slide, just a couple of um, do's and don'ts. I'm not, I'll just touch on a few of these. We'll share these, but like, I think number one do is a, you need to prepare a flexible integrated model. So that's PL balance sheet cash flow. Um, even though we're looking for the cash flows, the output, we need to have the balance sheet to make sure it makes sense and that we're watching our liabilities at the same time as managing the cash. 
A driver-based model, the seven drivers I spoke about, uh, again, critical because we can, number one, it gives you the flexibility to change those drivers. If the drivers we initially thought um, that don't come to pass or if we can refine them, um, but also by, by, by going, taking the time to build the drivers, it brings in other people in the organization into the process, such as sales teams, um, you know, stock management teams, AR, AP, and you've got a, a collective responsibility and buy into the, to the, the cash flow. It's not just a, you know, a financial document. Um, it's actually, it's actually embedded in the business. And uh, next one I'd mention is keep a history of the actual so that we can compare the drivers that we thought versus what's actually happening. Um, so, you know, you might think to put in 30 days credit terms that all your, your customers will pay in 30 days because that's what's in the invoice. When reality in the industry, people take 30 days and a month and it's really an average of 45 days. That, that, that could be a, a material movement. So then you need to consider in the driver, is the driver 45 days and not the 30 days per your, per your invoice. And again, you're rolling, maintaining a rolling forecast, rolling out through the periods, comparing actuals to uh, projected. And, you'll, and uh, the, more, the more iterations of that, the more accurate you will get. Obviously, I do think it's worth mentioning to monitor the credit, the, your, your credit control of customers. Um, it's the biggest it's the biggest type of cash we see when when cash flows start getting stressed it's it's money tied up in receivables so again back to my point on on managing that um throwing more resources at that currently i think is is not a bad idea uh on the don'ts then don't rule out um you know business environment factors such as cost inflation and currency exchange rates again you can build that into one of your scenarios that if you have a good section of revenue into the uk that the sterling rate goes against you what does that do to your cash flows um do not develop a cash flow in isolation from the balance sheet There's, it, we need the balance sheet to be integrated to make sure that we're managing our liabilities um so you need your integrated p l balance sheet cash flow um, again, don't make it a financial document. Do, in, do bring in the, the leaders of each of the departments. And I think I'd, I'd, I'd wrap up saying, you know, don't take an overly optimistic view on the base case. We want, a, you know, a neutral, steady, um, not, you know, not overly prudent, but we need a steady base case. And then we'll build out scenarios and sensitivities from that. So I think your base case is something you really um, use the drivers that you really think will come to pass and the results you, you'll, you know, you think you'll get with hard work. And then we can work off those for, for different sensitivities up and down. Um, it gives us a good grounding on the cash flow. So, uh, that's me. We'll share the slides and I'll pass back to Paddy. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so we have um, a couple of questions in. Um, the first one, um, our bank have told us that the credit guarantee only kicks in once existing collateral has been exhausted. Um, I don't know, Nick, do you want to take that one or, or Michael? Nick, maybe you go first. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Thanks, Paddy. The I think there's probably, there's, assuming this refers to the credit guarantee scheme, um, where there is reference to existing collateral, the, I suppose the point with this is that if you have good collateral, um, you may be able to, certainly, if, for instance, if you have a piece of land or, or a building to collateralize, you probably can get finance cheaper using that as a collateralized secured loan facility than you would do for the loan you can get through the credit guarantee scheme. So it's designed so that credit guarantee scheme can kick in for the loan, the lending requirement beyond what the collateral will support, um, where there obviously is a more expensive form of debt, but it means you don't end up paying the more expensive price for the full loan if you can get some of it at a lower price because it's well collateralized. I think that's that's the point there. Um, however, if you, if you have any further questions on that, please get in touch directly and we'll, we can help work through what the issue is and, and see if we can help um, to identify the right solution. Thanks, Nick. And the next one is is very uh, directly uh, related to you. So, hi, Nick. Um, John Beckett from Channel Site. As a scale-up growth business that is venture-backed, we have a challenge with overcoming the business and the stress definition. 
I understand that this is related to preventing an issue with state support definitions from the EU, but I also understand that other countries have already uh, are already setting aside such state support avoidance measures given the nature of the crisis. Can you comment on whether the definition may be removed or modified to enable companies that are primarily R&D focused, but who may not have capitalised all R&D on the balance sheet to avail of SPCI supports? Thank you. Um, I think the, the for, for subsequent schemes that come to the market, there will be some change in this respect in that it will be counting um, businesses that are, are deemed to be evidently viable prior to the end of last year. So it be, businesses don't fall into the situation because of the impact of the crisis. It's more about what was the state beforehand. I suppose, John, the, the challenge is, is, is the suitability of debt for certain types of companies um, and whether that's an appropriate form of finance if the company's at a stage or is of a type that isn't um, necessarily producing regular cash flows with which to serve uh, a debt transfer or a loan. Um, I think what you are seeing in other countries is other complementary measures being brought to the market that can support businesses that aren't able necessarily to avail of credit in the first instance. I think a good example here is the enterprise support scheme that, um, that Michael described from Enterprise Ireland. Uh, which looking at your business is definitely a sector, you'll be one in one of the sectors that they will support with this scheme and where you can't get SBCI funding or you can't get a loan because it may not be appropriate for the type of business, you can avail of that 800,000 euro uh, funding package. Um, now I'm not, no idea whether that's enough or the right size for your business, but certainly um, is a very strong extra step beyond credit that you, it looks like you would be, you would be, um, eligible for, obviously I can't comment in detail because EI will have its own process and application forms and so forth for that, but I do think it's worth checking that out in the meantime. And as I said, we are at an initial stage in terms of these supports and they may well evolve um, going forward or you may see other supports being brought to the market. The UK brought its innovation type businesses and startup type businesses supports literally out I think today um, and we're starting to see what, what they're doing in that space. And the UK is definitely um, a little bit ahead of where we are in terms of the support it's brought forward. Thanks, Nick. Um, next question, maybe I'll, I'll direct to Michael. Um, question re SBCI supports. Are the pillar banks focused on their existing customer base or will they have bandwidth to consider new business with SBCI support? Um, what I understand, I understand that the banks are focusing on their own clients at the moment and uh, clients that are availing of uh, current uh, situation and then seeking additional uh, SBCI support. So I, I think, I do think that the banks are, from what I hear from, from talking to bankers, are focusing on their, uh, their existing clients rather than taking on new clients. That having been said, with the SBCI support uh, on working capital, um, the the eighty percent guarantee um, can be attractive from a from a credit perspective from the bank. But I think the banks are focusing on their own customers. Okay, uh, I'm just going to go down through here. Can I just comment on that as well? Sure, um, Nick. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. I mean, I think the banks are responding as well to what they're seeing come in the door. Um, which is a large volume of their existing customers, both um, private consumers and businesses looking for that initial relief and the, and the availability of overdrafts and increased overdrafts. So um, we're really only seeing loan applications start to come in off the back of the, the SBCI COVID working capital scheme. So I would, I would encourage businesses that aren't necessarily borrowers already, or if they are using the schemes to shop around and talk to other banks, I don't think the banks have, have abandoned their need to compete with each other, but they are responding to what's coming in the door, and that means that they are seeking to look after their existing clients, which is understandable to a, to a degree. But I don't think that should put businesses off from applying to one or more banks, even if they haven't got a prior relationship, because the lack of security requirements or the lower security requirement that the SBCI schemes bring should make, make it much easier to onboard and to access funding from a different bank than you might normally do. Um, and I think that also factors into another question um, around um, unsecured limits, um, where it's talking about uh, asking around, is, is it only worth going for the loans up to half a million? It's important to note that, that loans above that still benefit from an 80% guarantee. So if you're going into a bank and they ask for security because it's above half a million, that's fair enough. 
but they shouldn't be expecting their normal degrees of security. You should be able to provide a fixed and floating charge or the degree of security that you can, but they shouldn't take take it from them that you, that you need to then provide full security thereafter because they're still benefiting from the 80% guarantee. They're just looking to obtain some security really to help them cover the 20% exposure that they retain. Yeah, and I yeah, think I maybe... Maybe just to add again from, from our experience, I mean, as, as I said at the outset, a lot of the asks to date have been around, you know, moratoriums, which, which to be fair to the banks, they have, I think they've been very good in that regard. Obviously, the, the bigger and the more difficult asks are probably coming in the next, you know, three, four weeks as we gear up for the opening, which is going to be new money. And, you know, that, that's a far more difficult decision for a bank. And, you know, the questions around the, the viability of the business, the future trajectory of the business. So I think what we've discussed here, what Michael and Nick have discussed become very relevant in those discussions. And indeed, you know, I understand there will be other initiatives announced over the coming weeks, but that to me is where the real crunch is going to be around that, that new money ask. And, and that's why, you know, along the, the lines of, of the, the theme of this webinar is it's really just getting out early, knowing where you stand and at least be prepared because the, the challenge will be how is that funded? Um, so I think that's one message people could take from this. Um, next question, um, re-headcount criteria for schemes. Is this measure pre-COVID or post-COVID? Example, if a company had 20 staff Feb, but nine in April, which metric applies? Maybe Nick, you could clarify that. Or wow, you're, you're, you're really testing my knowledge <laughs> at this stage. Um, from my understanding, it's a look back over, um, tends to be a look back over 12 months. So I think it's what was the average full-time equivalent. So you, you count together, if you have two part-time staff, you can count them together to get a full staff. Um, but I think the it's, 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 it's an interesting question. I haven't come across that, but my, my recollection is it's a look back, but... Um, it's probably best to talk to the provider of the scheme in question that you're looking to talk to to, to check on that. Okay, next one. Um, is invoice discounting a very obvious additional solution here? It seems underplayed in presentation. Dara, if businesses are looking to tighten on their debtors but flex on creditors, do they just knock each other out? Yeah. Um, yeah, look, ID is, is really works well in some businesses and, and and we have it called out there on their, on their facilities and the considerations to optimize cash management. Um, you know, the, 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 where ID doesn't work out well is if there, um, you know, if there's concentration issues uh, around, you know, a, a high level of revenue going to a few numbers of um, customers, you can get concentration issues. Um, but, but it must absolutely is a good option to look at as, as is a straight overdraft in certain circumstances. So um, I, I definitely didn't intentionally underplay it. It is, it is definitely something to look at. Yeah, I might just add there. I mean, I do, I do feel that, you know, as we, as we reopen businesses, you know, there is going to have to be some kind of a link around support and ensuring that it's used to, to clear the, the, the creditor base because, you know, ultimately that's what flows down through, through all the businesses. So that goes both ways for companies. So I think I can see there will be, or you, you would expect there's going to have to be some kind of a link around support and ensuring that's used predominantly to clear down supply base because, um, that, that's really what's going to get businesses ticking is getting the money flowing again. So I think that's important to say. Um, how do you determine which loan scheme is best suited to your business? Also, can you explain eligibility codes and application process? Michael, can I maybe ask you to look at that one? Yeah. Okay. So look, I would recommend um, for the, the, the business that's asking that question, the person asking that question that they um, firstly establish if they um, meet the criteria for the um, EI business planning grant um, and then um, avail of that grant uh, because a lot more will fall out on the back of that. Um, but I know for the SBCI um, eligibility is available through the website and I, I hear that there's a quite quick turnaround um, once that is applied for. Um, but with regards to the Enterprise Ireland um, new scheme, uh, that it's clear that 
um, the business ha needs to have gone to the banks or the SBCI in advance of applying for the um, Enterprise Ireland scheme. So, um, look, I think if you if if it, like the key thing is get get the advice through the um, uh, through the application if you apply for the grant is is what I would say is kind of a starter on that. Michael, I think also on the EI scheme, I think they are willing to entertain a parallel application. So as long as you're applying to the banks, you can get your, your application and discussion going with Enterprise Ireland in parallel. So they don't want people to, to go off, spend time, waste time talking to banks if it's not going to work, um, and then have to start the process with EI. I think if you are an EI client, one of the best places to, to start is to talk to EI in the first place. Um, or if you're in one of their sectors, then pick up the phone to them and, and, and get in touch. Very good. Next question. Um, how long do you think it will take for SBCI funds to be made available once the application is made? Again, Nick, sorry, we're probably going to direct that one to you. That's fine. Um, it does vary by business and vary by the nature of the application. However, um, for smaller loans, um, certainly loans up to 250, 300,000, the banks generally have a very fast over the phone approach to um, granting loans, it's much more like a consumer process, so that can be pretty quick. Um, it's also important to note that the once you've provided all information that the banks require, um, they are bound by the, the SME code of conduct to give you a response within 15 days. So um, if you're concerned about it taking a long time, ask them the question up front, do you have every bit of information you need from me? If not, what do you need? And provide that and get that confirmation because at that point, clock is ticking and they have to come back to you within a certain time frame. So um, if you can provide all the information up front and you have a, a straightforward application, uh, we think the banks will, will respond and turn this around very quickly. Um, obviously for larger loans, when you get up to kind of 2 million, 3 million, it's going to take a little bit longer just to, for them to do a, a proper credit assessment. Okay, we've uh, another one for you here, Nick. Um, this is quite specific. Um, uh, obviously you, you won't be able to comment on specific cases but I'll read it out uh, on a prior query through Bank of Ireland inquiry result in negative on the application they were asked to reroute the application to SBCI information back was there was no point as the underwriters were one and the same and the, if the application for Bank of Ireland was negative it would therefore be negative to SBCI is this the case? Um, well the SBCI does not do the underwriting decision in this case. It, it, what we do is we, we give a view as to the eligibility of the business and the eligibility of the application um, under the policy requirements. So is it is it to the right type of business and the right type of sector at the right type of size and that kind of thing. So yeah, there's no there's no right of appeal back through the SBCI for a loan decision. However, there is the credit review office. So if a, a borrower is not happy with the verdict that's been given by the bank, you can first off, appeal that decision to the bank themselves. And then failing that, you can go to the credit review office and talk to John Triplowen or Catherine Collins, and they will look at your loan application for you and they will help you work it through with the banks to get to um, a, a proper conclusion. And often they can help to restructure an application so that it then works and is effective. And it's a basically a free service. It's a very high value and high quality. Uh, it's definitely something to check out if you're not happy with the response you're getting from your bank. And I think also, you know, availing of the grants and taking the supports to to work with your advisors and to talk to your your, your accounting firms and, and, and consulting firms and advisors is very important in that context as well, because then they can help to to guide the application and, and to give a second view as to whether the bank is being unreasonable or not. Great. Okay, well look, we're we're just just an hour now. So um uh, hopefully people found that um, useful. I suppose, look, you know, if there's a few key messages, it's, it's be proactive, um, speak to your stakeholders, plan, um, you know, the viability of the business, which, you know, um, is probably the most important point, must be brought front and center to any um, communications with your stakeholders. And I think that that's so important. Um, so um, look, thanks everyone for, for joining the webinar. Um, hopefully people found it useful and as I said we will be making the slides and the webinar available um, and, and sending it out to, to people who have been on it and also people who weren't able to get on it. Um, so thanks again and um, stay safe everybody. Thanks Chris.